got Anne Patterson here as my guest today. And what I would like Anne to do is introduce herself, because if I try and introduce her, I'll probably get it all wrong. So do you want to tell us who you are and what you get up to these days? Yeah, I'm Anne Patterson. I'm the coordinator of Coventry Green Party. I guess that's my sort of main if you know, um, area of uh, activism and campaigning. I am also involved with other kind of related groups such as Fossil Free Coventry, the COP26 Coventry Coalition Hub, uh, of Rebellion Coventry, so various other um, active groups in the city. Um, so, and in my working life, I work for the NHS as a manager for community mental health services. So you're a busy lady. Yeah, very busy. <laughs> well, thank you for sparing me the time. Um, so, I mean, just about the Green Party, how long has it been going in Coventry, do you know? Um, well, it's been going since before my time and involvement in the party, so... How long have you been involved? Um, well, I've been a member of the Green Party, I think, since 2010, and I've been actively involved in the local party since 2014. Okay. So it was a going concern then. So, okay. I don't know exactly how long it's been, been going. And how's the Green Party doing in Coventry? <clears throat> well, we're working hard on um, our first Green Councillor elected in Coventry. We actually feel that we've actually got um, a very good chance of getting a Green Councillor elected uh, in the local elections this year. Uh, we've been targeting a particular area of Coventry where we've been focusing our campaigning, um, working with local residents on their issues, um, and uh, working to establish ourselves as a real contender. And we came, in that particular ward, we came very close to the Labour candidate last year, and this year we actually feel we're, we're in a position to win. And that's really important, because if we get a Green Council elected, and then that would be a base for in the future, building on that and getting more Green Councils elected. When you have uh, actual councillors in the council, then you're in the room, as it were, you can actually start to uh, actually influence local decision making, policies, where money is allocated, um, you know, Policy making about sort of climate change, local sustainability, things that benefit local people. And the Greens elsewhere in the country, and particularly the West Midlands, have actually been um, very successful on this front. So around the West Midlands, in 2010, there were about three councillors around the West Midlands, Green councillors. Uh, as of last year, um, I think there were over 60. Um, Council, councils around the West Midlands um, and uh, in some councils they hold the balance of power mm. in Herefordshire that actually in the administration with independence and where and and in that and in that council they've created a local sustainable transport strategy they've stopped the building of a bypass they're supporting a scheme to provide low carbon replacements for boilers they're building new zero carbon council houses. They've used COVID money creatively to rejuvenate footpaths, which benefit local people and encourage tourism. So um, you can see what can be done when you actually have Greens at councils. And that's really what our focus is to try and achieve locally is that our primary um, aim is to get, you know, Greens elected locally, but also to, to promote green issues, sustainability, yeah. uh, more broadly in working with a whole range of other local groups. So nationally, I think there's one MP, isn't there? Yeah, we have one MP, Caroline Lucas, who, considering she's our only MP, is actually, you know, quite widely known, profile, yeah. which is above her weight in terms of actually um, having a public profile, 
uh, raising things uh, in Parliament. Uh, but we also have uh, more than one um, peer in the in the House of Lords, Natalie Bennett and um, Jenny Jones is our other peer, and, and we have um, people on the London Assembly, for example. So we have, and, and as I say, lots and lots of uh, Green councillors and councils that are, and quite a few councils where Greens are actually in the administration. Um, the electoral system in this country really, really works against us. The first past the post system, you know, elsewhere in Europe, where they have proportional representation, um, uh, Greens do very well. Uh, lots of Greens in the um, European Parliament. In fact, um, uh, for a brief period, we did actually have a number of Green MEPs, including one in the West Midlands. <laughs> Uh, until Brexit took us out of, out of Europe, and we know there are countries in Europe where, where again, Greens are actually in national uh, in coalition in national administrations. So that so it really promotes a policy politics of working together, finding areas of consensus. You know, sort of build. You know, which is what politics should be. Politics is the art of the possible. It should be how do we get things done to benefit. Um, communities rather than the very adversarial model that we unfortunately have in this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and there's, there's, I mean, there's not, there's not much that can be done to change the first past the post system, is it? That's not, not going to change in a hurry, is it? Um, <clears throat> well, it, there's, it's a possibility because uh, in terms of um, having an alternative um, administration in our national government, it would have to be probably some sort of coalition arrangement between the um, current opposition parties because it would seem very unlikely that Labour would actually get enough MPs elected to have a have a majority on their own. And so the Labour, you know, many people in the Labour movement are coming around to mm. um, realising that uh, proportional representation would be a better alternative for for them as well as uh, the other minor parties. So it's, I think it's time will come. It's, you know, it, I think it's a matter of when, not if. Um, and, and as I say, increase, you know, increasingly there are the proportional systems used. Uh, I mean, we, and there's also a campaign to get it brought in for uh, local government elections. Which, because if you like, we already have multi um, council awards, so it wouldn't actually be <laughs> that, that radical. So um, I think, uh, but even without that being in place, as I say, there's a lot we can do. And as I say, we are have increasingly successful in within local government. And in fact, uh, work that is part of our principles is work work on local levels anyway. Work you know, where communities are, you know, a sort of bottom up approach rather than a very sort of top down approach. And what's the Green Party's attitude to climate change? Um, well, it's um, a, a very core concern of ours. Um, I think out of all of the parties, certainly in this country, the Green Party has been leading the way on raising awareness of climate change as a uh, uh, as a massive threat to the world and and to our country, um, and one that uh, creates massive injustices for um, poorer countries, for uh, and for poorer people in in Western countries as well. So the Green Party um, has got a whole raft of policies which are around how do we um, move towards sustainable uh, energy system and, and way of living overall and and has had those policies in place um you know in fact for years and and i think has has actually started to influence the national conversation and other parties have come along and that labor have gone oh well we, we need a green new deal well green parts have been talking about that for a lot longer but but again you know, wanted to work in consensus, in collaboration. Other parties adopt 
those kind of policies and want and, and actually do things to put them into practice you know you know whoever whoever it is who does it you know it doesn't matter really it, it's just that it needs to happen and so you haven't started campaigning yet no we, we, um we are we are we we are campaigning um particularly in our in our sort of uh, uh, target area um in fact in that area we, we campaign year round but as i say in terms of wide campaign um will will be because at the moment we're, we're we're in the stage of um, getting every getting all of our candidates lined up um you, you know you have to collect nomination signatures and then it will that all goes off the council yeah. then. so it's just making sure we've got everybody lined up and yeah. kind of and and and, and and then we'll be um, sort of putting, uh, updating our website with with the, with our money with our manifesto. It'll be it'll be sort of very similar to last year, but yeah, a lot uh, built into it is lots of stuff around local sustainability yeah. and, um, and the sort of things that we could and should be doing. Okay, that's fantastic. So that's a good start to this um, little podcast. So about global warming itself i mean i'm assuming that you i mean that you that you believe it's happening that you believe people should be doing stuff i mean you talked about um communicating about climate change and kofkan is is one of the objectives we try to do i mean for example with these podcasts is to is to inform people about climate change. So, do, what what do you think Covcan? So, it's Country Climate Action Network, which was originally a network of activists, and I think you came to the inaugural meeting, didn't you, which we had in the council house. Um, but with you know, we're trying to we're trying to help activists work together and plan together and plan future activities and whatever, but also to communicate with the, with the people of Coventry to let them know what's going on and suggest ideas and things. How would you suggest that that Cov can is becomes more effective at communicating with the public? What would you like to see us do? Difficult question, obviously. Well, I mean, one. Of, I mean, I think one of the things that needs to happen in Coventry, and that in fact we, you know, a number of groups have been pushing for for some time, is well, first of all, more uh, actual engagement with the council, and 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 we've been pushing for the council to um, engage local groups and and interested individuals for years now. Um, and say involve us. We need, you know, we all need to be part of the discussion around um, climate change. Uh, you know what we could and should be doing locally, um, and that you know this has happened. You know this has been happening elsewhere in the West Midlands, elsewhere around the country. But so far, Coventry City Council are absolutely massively lagging behind on this front. There was a recent, they had a recent conference about climate change. But in fact, excluded virtually all of the um, local groups um, yeah. who actually have an interest. So it's it, you know, so so I think one of the things that Cov can could be doing is 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 is, is pushing for something, uh, uh, um, not just an event, but really a whole a whole process of um, community engagement in, involving local groups and how. And how the local communities, because uh, I think there has to be some kind of leadership, some sort of direction to to this process around in, involving um, local community. I think, and I think the council is key. The council actually has to, has, you know, has to take a lead with this, and to, and to then, but to also be prepared to work with groups like can and then to, to build that as a platform and then part of the strategy be, will be how do we then reach out to all kinds of 
organisations and groups around you know, how does everyone move towards um, it, you know carbon you know being carbon neutral um, and that would be and so I suppose obviously local government will mention businesses the business community is very important so it will be a, there'd need to be a whole strategy around engagement with businesses local public organizations such as uh, the NHS and I know and I know that the NHS does actually have a strategy for moving towards net zero so um, uh, the education institutions obviously got two big universities in Coventry around what are they doing um, other uh, other you know and then smaller scale things like schools school I think schools are, are massive uh, there's a whole there's a whole area around uh, what could schools be doing to um, to build it into their curriculum to um, uh, you know to, to actually do sort of practical things using their school grounds better, you know, actually, you know, planting trees, um, educating kids around well, all of the different um, issues involved with climate. So I think there's a whole piece around education, and I know that there is there are schools um, and, and school groups, academy groups, and so on, who are who who would be interested in engaging in that way. So there's schools, um, uh, faith groups, churches. Um, I know, um, I'm not sure if we've actually got a formal eco church in Coventry. I know there are places where you have eco churches where or, or churches adopt, you know, again, trying to sort of raise awareness about this and looking at how they can move in that direction. And obviously, other faith communities, we've got lots of faith communities in Coventry. I know there's a group called the Eco Seeks. Um, uh, um, and I, I'm not sure if they have a branch in Coventry. But um, certainly, my husband, who does a lot of um, uh, uh, green events, such as tree tree related events, has seen uh, a group of eco seeks turn up and and plant loads of trees. So, I mean, it's I mean, there's so much potential. It would be how how that would be achievable with obviously a, a, a you know a, a fairly small organisation. But I think that's about how you then how you build a network and then those people go out and take it out to their communities, their interest groups. Um, because basically it's a conversation that ultimately needs to happen pretty well with everyone in, in the city. And then, you know, um, uh, commercial businesses, shops, particularly big supermarkets plus smaller shops, how can they move in that direction? Um, and it also ties in with things like um, moving towards zero waste, um, which isn't climate change exactly, but, it, but also plastic waste is a huge problem. So, and I know, for example, my local co-op last year or the year before actually installed a whole load of um, dispensers for, for dry goods. And, I, and my local organic shop has loads of um, dry stuff in, in jars. So wherever I can, I will buy um, dry stuff um, and put it in my own bag rather than buying it in sort of plastic bags. And then they, and they also they their veggies loose and you and they encourage people to use reusable bags. So I mean I know that's slightly getting off, but it's the sort of it's an example of the sort of um, ways in which you know people can change <clears throat> in the right direction. So it's it's um, and I think about you know communicating with the sort of public in general, sort of public events, doing stuff that's, say, for example, at the Godiva Festival. Um, I know in the, they have a green, they have a tent called the Green Space, uh, where, where people can have stalls. So, I mean, there, you know, there is basically so much, so much potential. I mean, I would like to see us having, um, in commentary, a, a People's Climate Assembly, one of, um, I know one of the key ideas to come out of Extinction Rebellion is is saying to have have people's assemblies where, where the methodology is that you actually you know you have people all sort of representative of the of, of, of the population so you kind of actually make sure that you you represent all of the different demographics and so on um, and then but you you bring in experts to kind of present uh, that group with um, information about climate change um, and about 
all of the potential things that could be done to um, to try and uh, slow it down um, and uh, adapt to it, and then and then those groups actually, you know, re, you know, sort of look at what they feel would be practicable in in practice or what they feel, um, uh, and, and, and and you know, and come up with policy recommendations for. Um, on a national level or on, on a local level. And I think, and I really, very much think we should be doing something like that. Local. A People's Climate Assembly, I guess, would have to be implemented by the local council, wouldn't it? And again, if it comes down to um, the imp absolute importance of, of engagement, you know, by the local council and, 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 and with the local council, in doing something like that. Coventry's way behind well, yeah. other people. I mean, Warwickshire has already done most of all this stuff. <clears throat> That's, and that part of that is probably because you, you have Greens in, 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 in the councils in Warwickshire, Warwick District and Warwick, Warwickshire County Council. Right. You know, then you, you've got Green Voices who are actually, you know, promoting exactly these sort of ideas and saying we well, should be doing it so maybe that's not a surprise as to why they're doing it and probably haven't so far so maybe what we should say is that if you want to get things changed and get coventry council to get off its backside and actually do something we need to vote for more green candidates no well, the candidates who are at least are saying that the you know they want to they they're promoting green ideas, but the trouble is, we, I, know, I mean, we know there are people, there are, we know there are Labour councillors and people within the Labour group who are, um, you know, fairly on board with, with, with these sort of ideas. And we, and I know that there were some who previously came to the Cob, Cob Cam meetings that were held at the council house, um, and uh, and and we were engaging them with Russell Free Coventry. The trouble is, the lead the the group, if you like, in power within the Labour group, is is not so kind of on board uh, with it. And and the trouble is that the ones who would like to kind of work in that more collaborative way, you know, they are uh, hamstrung, if you like, by by that dominance of that group, who then say, well, this is, you know, these are our policies, this is what we support, it. and 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 people can't go out of line. You know, literally, people, you know, because um, if, if, if people want to get ahead in the local council and want to actually, if you like, be given um, positions within within the council, then they have to be they have to toe the line with, with within the leadership. So, so they're not really able to sort of start, you know be an independent voice, um, you know, for these matters in in um, at, you know that effectively so but i think we are but i think the existence of quite of strong green activist groups in the city is having an influence the council you know they are you know they have they are they are putting in place some policies and some uh, actions which are starting to go in the right direction so i will give them credit for things like sort of uh, aiming for an all electric um bus fleet in Coventry and so on but there's massive amounts more that they could and should be doing that they're not doing. Don't you think that their their focus is more on getting jobs rather than actually reducing the carbon footprint? Um well I would say, I would say the focus is on um jobs and investment so it, I think the focus is um primarily economically driven rather than with a real kind of focus on what do we need to um, uh, get to sort of net zero locally. Um, although, again, I'm not against, you know, in a way, we, we need to take businesses with us and we need, we need actually um, what needs to happen to be seen as an economic opportunity, this whole idea of a Green New Deal, that there's a lot of opportunity in shifting our economy from a carbon-based, carbon-driven economy, economy to um, a non-carbon-driven economy. I mean, there's a, I mean, there's a huge amount of 
um, work and investment that's going to be needed to actually um, um, make that change. And that actually could, you know, well, you know, if it's implemented, will create lots of lots of jobs. And in fact, unfortunately, we're lagging in behind in this country in that we uh, some of the technology, you know, there's some of the technologies that we need. We we we're still importing from other countries. We we not we not got enough sort of homegrown um, kind of you know capability to to make all the stuff that we need. So so I'm, so we're not against it 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 creating you know, absolutely not not against it you know creating jobs creating economic opportunities. But as you say, yeah, the council's focus seems to be where it's you know where it's an opportunity for investment rather than so so for example there's the there is this focus on um, electric vehicles electric buses and development of gigafactories and so on but not on sort of lower tech um non kind of business less business related things such as a proper walking and cycling strategy yeah, yeah. so that's one of the examples where the, the, the focus is all in one direction, whereas actually you need to be looking at how do you actually reduce demand for um, uh, for vehicle based travel um, as a as a as a first point, particularly for local journeys. And uh, and I think that's one of our key things as 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 the local Green Party is that that is something that is very much lacking locally. We don't have and that and other councils. You know, do have you know a, a, a active travel strategy uh, which promotes walking, cycling, use of public transport, and for example, you know, look just looking at the example of our sort of target campaign area, um, where there is some major roads that go through the area, and where uh, and some of them uh, there is a lack of pedestrian crossings in key locations, and for example. Where you've got to get get across a really busy road, and it's the route to a local school, and people can't therefore safely walk their kids to school um, from across that area mm -hmm. because they can't actually cross that road safely. And that's just you know that's just an example. Whereas what we would need to do across the city is go, where do people need to get around on foot, um, and are things there uh, you know have we got the right pedestrian crossings or kind of bridges or, or underpasses or whatever to, to enable them to do that but whereas the car is still king and then having a load of electric vehicles on the roads isn't going to actually won't won't change that so we so it, we need a, and, and again that is not going to cost huge amounts of money in the scheme of things you know you could you could you know where there's, there's somewhere with traffic lights anyway it wouldn't be that hard to change some of those to pedestrian crossings and then you could promote walking buses to school because then another problem that happens is that all the parents are bringing their kids to school in their cars and then the local and then the, and then it's it's actually dangerous for the ones who are walking to school can you, can you explain what a walking bus is it really it really annoys local residents they go oh there's how many people turning from their cars well you could kill more than one bird with one stone you would have healthier kids if they're walking more um so walking bus is when you have some a few adults leading a group of children rather than one adult for each child yeah so you so so you could you know but you've got to make it safe for them to be able to do that and the same with uh, and 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 obviously, people want to get around an area for other reasons, like get into your local local shops. Because again, encouraging people to shop locally, um, uh, use their local shops rather than driving. Again, if we can take a lot, if we can take cars out of a lot of those short journeys, um, you know, that would significantly reduce, um, you know, car use, fossil fuel use, and it would improve air quality. <laughs> Because air quality is another big side effect of uh, car use and uh, another vehicles around the city. As we know, we have a big air quality problem in Coventry. So yeah, walking and cycling strategy, again, a joined up approach to cycling, thinking about, because we have got some cycle routes, but it's very, it's very ad hoc. There are certain places where um, 
things are put in place, but they're not all joined up across the city. Mm. We have, um, we've collaborated with the Coventry Cycle Mayor, Adam Tranter, on promoting consultations, on uh, developing cycle routes. And But again, it needs to be a joined up network. There would need to be a kind of, a whole kind of network of cycle routes across the city where, which are safe, you know, segregated from from traffic and so on, because people just don't. A lot of people would cycle, but don't feel safe. Yeah, to do so. And and um, I mean, I mean, we literally, we've. Uh, I think somebody found an example of a cycle lane which was one bike long, which was completely. <laughs> And and you have situations where cycle you have a bit of cycle there, and then it suddenly stops, and you're back onto a, a, a main road. So, you know, again, you know, if you go to Europe, many cities in Europe, you'll see far fewer cars on the road, and you'll see far more people on bikes and on foot, and it just makes for a nicer, you know, it's a nicer environment for everyone. So. Again, and, that, and the council doesn't have that. The council doesn't have, um, you know, a, a joined up walking and cycling strategy. Right. And then the public transport, you know, again, yes, we have, I don't know, you know, buses and so on across it. But one of the one of the most basic things that we don't have is is a is a is a sort of public transport link between the uh, train station and the bus station. So, for example, we had somebody coming from another area to sort of help with a campaigning day at the weekend and came by train. And then he was saying, how do I get to where, you know, how do I get to where you are? Mm -hmm. Just a simple thing, like a shuttle bus that goes from the train station, goes around the city centre, you know, do a circular route, go to, the, go to the bus station, back round, and just kind of continuously doing that. I mean, I mean, obviously, it's going to be too late to redesign our whole. You know, we can't. Um, you know, obviously, they've rebuilt the train station, but there isn't. You know, the, the bus station is still on the other side of the city centre. So it's it's just something simple like that would make it would make a difference. That's fantastic. Have you have you come across? I mean, you talked about the cycling mayor. Have you come across the walking mayor? I, I was doing an interview in this series of podcasts with a, a girl from India and she she was a walking ambassador and they have walking mares. Oh, I haven't come across that. No, I haven't either, so I'll have to find out more about that. Yeah, I would, would love to find out more about that. Cause... So I'll, I'll put an article on our website. And that is fantastic. I mean, you've inspired me, but it's obvious that we need to do a huge amount more than we're currently doing. <laughs> I need a I need a stack of volunteers to I mean we, I think we need to to run a large campaign maybe with the cough can website logo or something. Well, I know there are. I mean, I think what I know the country Green New Deal, yeah. who kind of who started up about a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, kind of coincided with the pandemic, which has kind of held things back a bit. Yeah. But I know they're very much wanting to kind of um uh, get get going again so i think you know and again they were sort of a quite broad brush um group which involves lots of local groups so i think there's potential to sort of try and bring all of these different yeah. together. they're looking to organize a kind of a, a kind yeah. of you know, a conference i know the cop 26 coalition hub was all was also where we did some uh local campaigning events in the lead up to the cop 26 um thing in Glasgow last November um, and, that, and that group was talking about having trying to organize a, trying to organize an event because we because because uh, again the UK actually still holds the COP presidency up until COP 27 in Egypt later this year so we're we still in theory got that sort of leadership role internationally although um, unfortunately the government seems to have road back even on the sort of limited yeah. that it was prepared to make but there is still room to put pressure on them unfortunately i think one of the sort of leading lights in that in that group is is very involved with the um bin strike campaign which is obviously a whole other other matter but again there are there are people who are in that network who i think would uh 
you know would support and it 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 it, it, it just it just takes that you know a few people working together to kind of you know make a start mm -hmm. you know and sort of put a bit of work into an organization but then i think it's very much about how you then you, know, you then create something where people are empowered to go away and and spread the word to you know and involve their local groups and, and communities so the, and, the, and there are sort of methodologies you know for doing that you know there are way you know there are you know it doesn't all again all have to be all sort of top down but it's about actually <laughs> there has to be somebody kind of you know making a start but i think it's I don't know if, do you know David Ridley from the Green New Deal? Well, I've had some correspondence with him and he's he's organising a meeting in the near future, so. Yeah, so I think that's definitely a, a good, yeah. a good, you know, I think I think there's a lot of room for sort of collaboration between, you know, COVCA and the Green New Deal, you know, and all, all of the different groups around. And, and he's agreed to do one of these podcasts, so, you know, hopefully that will be in the not too distant, we haven't, we haven't got a date for that, but yeah. That's fantastic. So if people want, I mean, if people like me are inspired by what, they, what they've heard and they want to help the Green Party, I'll put a link to the Coventry Green Party's website. Because then that's got some sort of, you know, our, our contact details and then, um, and then stuff will, you know, inquiries will kind of find their way to me. Um, so, you know, so, and then, um, you know we can sort of let people know how how they can help as i say it's good old-fashioned um a lot of it is you know putting leaflets through doors and, and and door knocking talking talking to local residents because again it's about you know if we're going to effect um meaningful change it actually has to be how does that how what does that look like in lo in local communities in local people's lives and that it comes down to the sort of thing I've already been talking about is how do we make it easier for people to kind of get around on foot and bicycle, you know, and not and 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 you know, and, and, and public transport options. So it's not saying no, we're not going to stop people from using um, cars. So because some people sort of think that means we we want to stop people from using cars, we're not gonna, we're not stopping. We don't want to stop people. It's we want to give people alternatives, particularly for those local journeys. Which could could be made by other means. Um, so it's and and people and people want that. People want to be able to get around like that. Um, uh, and also other ways of improving the local environment. Uh, actually, um, looking after green spaces, not cutting down trees. So one of the problem, you know, again, one of the issues with the local council is that again they're investing in. Um, uh, developments um you know such as new roads wider roads and so on which involve cutting down trees whereas the last thing we should be doing is cutting down trees we should keep all the trees we've got and plant plant a whole load more and i know this again the city council have got this program of tree planting although what it is is it's load of it's lots of little whips which are tiny little things that you know you put in on mass most of which will probably not survive you probably get 10 percent survival but where we so again it's laudable that they're planting trees but where we need more and um, more trees more um more greenery is actually within the city in because a lot you know if you go around a lot of these estates you see around the city or just green spaces around kind of public buildings or whatever is it's usually a, a whole load of grass and and then a few kind of shrubs round round the edge um so it's not very biodiverse it doesn't uh, and it doesn't uh, whereas if you actually have more trees um to, you know particularly sort of native trees native planting you can have edible planting there are other places that you know there's incredible edible in todmorden there's an incredible edible now in leamington where they're looking at planting edible species so that people could literally go around and have food for free you know, so it, you're getting multiple benefits from so again yeah, more trees, and and in our target area again, there's there's a, there's a nice little project recently is an estate which is owned by citizen, um and and uh, a number of trees have been planted recently and they managed to get some 
onto the Tree Wardens Network, managed to get some funding from the Tree Council, and, and, and so we planted little groups of ornamental trees around the estate, which is what the, the residents wanted. And then that's the sort of thing that could be done across the city. More, more trees, and if you have trees, it actually cools down the local environment. So it's part of an adaptation to, um, they, you know, pull a certain amount of carbon out of the air, but it also cools the local environment. Because one of the things we, are, we, we do have to adapt to more extreme weather conditions. <laughs> We are, we are, we are facing increasing. You know, we will have heat waves, which will actually, in some cases, pose a, a threat to health, health locally. I mean, obviously, no, nothing like as um, uh, severe as um, might occur elsewhere around the world, where you know it could be. <coughs> unfortunately, if you get above certain temperatures and humidity conditions, <coughs> it's not survivable. And you, we could see uh, during this century heat waves that literally kill millions of people, unfortunately. But even in even in the You're UK, anyway. we, we we will see um, heat wave conditions that are <coughs> that are a threat to people uh, vulnerable to higher temperatures. Mm -hmm. So anything we can and and urban environments absorb more heat because all of that concrete and all of those building materials absorb more heat. So on a, so actually one of the things we could do to mitigate against that is to have a lot more trees, is to have, you know, much more dense um, planting of trees in those urban environments, because it actually, it, it, it does actually have a proven cooling effect, and, it's like, and it improves air quality, and it's just nice, it's nice environment. So it really, improves the quality of life. Yeah, and um, so, so that's something, you know, again, that's something we're promoting, you know, we want to see happen, again, it, it wouldn't be all down to you know if we you know the count it's not all down to the council to do it but um but again it's about working with communities and local groups not standing in the way and about making you know and, and about in, in encouraging it to happen and again about not cutting down the trees that we've got unfortunately so. that's fantastic i really appreciate your time and uh, I think that people like me will find it inspirational to listen to you. And hopefully we're, we will be able to change the attitude of Coventry City Council and make them a bit more open to other people's ideas rather than their own. Just, I hope so, yeah. yeah. Okay, fantastic. Because ultimately, if we, if we do all, if, you know, it's, it, it's a massive challenge to, to think about how do we change how we live, but ultimately, you know, the, you know, it's not just about oh, what do we, what do we have to give up? But it's actually we could be sort of, you know, living healthier and happier lives, if as as well as um, more sustainable lives. Because if we if we walk more and cycle more, that actually will have benefits for for health. Um, and if we improve our air quality, obviously that has benefits for health. You know, but bad air quality, you know, uh, affects health and actually kills, effectively kills people every year. Um, if we um, eat, and uh, something we haven't mentioned yet is about food. We need um, so um, food production, particularly meat, but also other kinds of intensive agriculture, also have a huge impact on carbon emissions. So again, that needs to be part of it. How it is lo a local food strategy promoting, uh, you know, how do we um, source more things um, that are, you know, local, regional, at least UK, grow more locally, edible planting can form part of that. Um, encourage, you know, encourage people, to, you know, to reduce meat consumption in the diet. So again, it's not saying people have to completely give it up. Obviously, people can go completely plant based, but that's good. Although again, you have to look at where that's sourced from as well, because some plant based foods actually are probably, you know, if you look at the whole uh, manufacture and transportation, they are still quite carbon intensive. So you have to you do have to look at that. But um, but again, that would be still. I mean, again, you know, we you know that um. Poor, you know, poor quality, poor quality food. You know, sort of junk food. You know, sort of uh, meat. You know, high meat consumption. All are detrimental to health. So again, you know, I mean, and, and something simple that everyone can do um, is eat 
seasonally. You know, think about what is in season and buy, you know, buy accordingly or try and grow some of your own. Like we've got an allotment down the end of our road where we grow a lot of our own food. We're not, we're not like the good life. We're not self-sufficient, but we always have some, we're always eating something that we've grown ourselves. And allotments don't, don't cost a lot or people can even, yeah, you know, um, combine it again. It'd be good to see networks of community gardens around, mm-hmm. um, city. and, and, and so, growing your own but it you know even even and i know some people have no i mean we don't actually have we've just got a small patio ourselves so we don't have a lot we don't have a huge garden ourselves um but even then you even if you've even if all you've got is a balcony you can still grow some sort of herbs and, and things but yeah just grow eating eating seasonally because that makes a huge difference for example um asparagus if you eat it out of season it's something like you know so like 1800 grams of carbon per kilo or whatever it is whereas if you use it in season it's about 60. i mean that, that's not the exact but it you know so so we have an asparagus season in this country which is you know around you know start probably starts around about an hour or a bit later so you're going to eat something like that eat it in season and then tomatoes well they're not really in season yet so i or strawberries not really in season yet the ones you're buying will have been grown in or under sort of under plastic with kind of you know um sort of fuels and you know uh so why not wait till it's actually in season and a lot of those a lot, a lot of those tomatoes you buy in the supermarkets weren't even properly ripe they actually use some sort of gas that make them go red but they're not actually they're not actually ripe so so yeah seasonal you know that's something that again everyone can do and again it's something that could be taken to school curriculums is um what's in season and what can you do with it um and and actually that would be cheaper because when it's in season generally it's going to be cheaper <laughs> so, so yeah i could go on and on <laughs> that's it all right well i mean you've given us lots and lots of ideas to be thinking about so thank you very much hopefully people will will then take action based on what they hear yeah, because some of it isn't, some of it is dependent on the government, some of it is dependent on the council, but a lot of it is stuff that, you know, businesses, um, organisations and individuals, you know, can be choosing to do, can be choosing to do now. Um, and yeah, some of it involves having a certain amount of, of money. I mean, like, for example, we've, you know, we've got like, our house, we've got double glazing, we've got insulation. Yes, it costs, and we've got solar panels, and it costs money up front, but we actually now save money on yeah. our, you know, our, our, our energy bills are considerably less than average because, because we've got all of that. So, so where people can, do, I mean, some of that, you know, there needs to be proper, um, grants available and, a, and, a, and, 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 and a massive program of, again, all kind of, um, social housing really, well, uh, it should be retrofitted to make it more energy efficient and all new social housing should be designed to be ideally zero carbon and um, going forward. Um, so you so said people are house owners, the things they can do. But as I say, just choosing to walk more, eat seasonally, you know, just those little things all add up, you know, turn the thermostat down, like the same, turn it down a degree, wear more sort of vests and jumpers and and so on to keep to keep warm um and you know think about where where you go on holiday do you really need to sort of fly all over the world i mean i mean i'm not saying i've never i mean i have flown but not for several years now and may well never fly again you know i'm sort of you know, look at you know i explore our, our own beautiful country um and and you know have you know fantastic holidays so so again i think it's it's although I mean over the pandemic, you know, in a way, so you know people were going abroad less, so some places were getting very sort of busy. But again, you, there are still corners of this country that you can go that um, uh, are you know don't get so busy. So it is. It's I think I mean, and we we're all at different stages on this um, in this journey, and and so it's not about sort of wagging fingers at people. It's actually just saying okay what 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 you know you know 
what one thing could you do and then what is the next what's the next thing that you could do yeah. and then yeah. um and then yeah, we, people have got to start somewhere haven't they all move together and when from the from the pandemic we can see that we can actually ch change can actually happen very fast when it needs absolutely yeah, yeah. it shows that we could so actually well, maybe this whole situation of the war in the U ukraine and the fact that it highlights our and our dependency um uh, on 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 russia for for gas and oil and that might be galvanizing uh, action to actually reduce that dependence whereas climate change didn't seem to be enough of a motivator yeah. Yeah. but that is a more immediate motivator and maybe that will actually because we need a kind of martial program really if people remember the martial program of reconstruction after the war mm -hmm. we need that for this really we need a a big scale focus program of how do we get you know properties insulated so so that they're energy efficient how do we um, move to alternatives for uh, meaningful uh, alternatives for energy sources uh, for um, housing and heating for, for transport um, food production and all of that so it's it's about you know it's a, about that big scale um, shift to a carbon neutral economy but once once you put that investment up front actually you, you know once you're conserving your energy you're using less once you're generating it renewables again the actual running costs are a lot less yes um, because you know the sun and the wind are kind of basically free it's just the actual kit that you need to harness it that you know and and, and maintaining that kit that costs money but once it's there it's actually it's actually a lot cheaper so it's a kind of a bit of an invest to save approach really <laughs> yeah i mean people tend to think short term don't they and that's one of the problems about climate change is that, that yes people know it's going to make things worse in the future but you know people are concerned about their lives tomorrow and this year it's worse now <laughs> it's not making things it will make things even even worse in the future but it's making things worse now. <laughs> we need to stop thinking it's a future problem and start thinking of, yeah. of, 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 yeah. as a problem. Yeah. But hopefully the uh, energy security and the increases in energy prices if that might mot is a more short term motivator. You might go, oh, well, in order to, you know, because, that, you know, because um, with that situation, those, you know, prices are going to kind of keep going up. So actually, if we can find ways to mitigate, mm -hmm full tax on the actual energy producers and benefiting from that increase in prices they're making more money mm. we actually need one of the things we can do one of the things we're advocating that the that the government aren't doing is a windfall tax on uh, on those energy producers and put that back to consumers who are struggling from those higher prices and then we and then as i say investment in in um energy conservation the energy conservation is always the best as, as is the not sexy part of the conversation but actually that's the bit that we need to be doing you know you need to concentrate on that reduce your energy demand and then think about how do you um supply that energy but you would need less of it <clears throat> overall so it's and I, and I think we have to we have to try and think positive we have to think you know you know how can we do this rather than kind of rather than kind of giving up and going well it's it, it's impossible to change this i mean we are heading for major major impacts which are irreversible but the anything we can do to uh, you know reduce that fossil fuel usage and to um adapt to climate change anything we can do makes it that little, little bit less um bad and and kind of potentially more survivable for us as a as a as a as a as, a, as, a, as human civilization so yeah i mean our 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 grandchildren will be living in a very very different world Absolutely. actually the world that they live in a, a lot of a lot of it is down to what we do now mm. yeah well, let's hope that they uh, 
that they benefit from the changes that we've been talking about, that, that they actually start to get implemented more quickly. Yeah, so. Okay, and thank you very much. Okay. Okay, bye. Bye.